organizing these webinars tonight. Tonight's webinar is sponsored by Sanofi Enzyme. Thanks for their continuous and generous support. With great pleasure, I would like to introduce our distinguished speaker, Prof. Adam Zucker. Prof. Adam Zucker is an associate professor of medicine and pathology laboratory medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. He received his MD from Yale University and completed an internship and residency in internal medicine at Brigham and Women Hospital and Ford Medical School. He continued his postgraduate training center at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, where he was a fellow in hematology and oncology. He holds a master's degree in translational research from the University of Pennsylvania. He is a director of the Bin Comprehensive Hemophilia and Thrombosis Assistant Director of the Bin Specialized Coagulation Laboratory and an Associate Director of Bin Chop Blood Center for Patient Care and Discovery. He conducts patient-oriented research on disorders of homeostasis and thrombosis. In the next 30 minutes, Prof. Adam will talk about an important topic, how I treat thrombotic thrombotic purpura. We will leave the question at the end, and please, if there is any question, you can write them and send them to us using the question icon. We are very glad and honored of having Prof. Adam with us. Thank you, Prof. Adam. And the mic is yours. Thank you much, very much, Dr. Riza, for the kind introduction. And thank you to you and Dr. Laskar and the uh, society for the uh, kind invitation to speak with you. Uh, it's really quite an honor. Um, and so as you noted, um, the title of my talk is How I Treat Thrombotic Thrombocytopenic Purpura, or TTP. Here are the learning objectives for my presentation. I hope that by the end, you will be able to identify which patients with thrombotic microangiopathy to treat for TTP and which patients not to treat that you will be able to review conventional TTP therapies, including plasma exchange, steroids, and their limitations. And finally, to discuss the role of rituximab and caplicizumab in the treatment of TTP. So by way of background, and I think is um, well known to this audience, TTP is a thrombotic microangiopathy mediated by deficiency of the von Willebrand factor cleaving protease atom TS13. It occurs in two forms. There is a congenital form, sometimes called upshaw shulman syndrome, due to bi-allelic atom TS13 mutations. But my remarks tonight will focus on the form that we see most commonly in adults, and that is immune-mediated TTP due to autoantibodies that either neutralize or cause clearance of atom TS13. Immune TTP is a rare disease with an incidence of about two cases per million per year. So this is a slide um, to remind you of the role that Adam TS13 plays in normal physiology. This is a blood vessel cut on longitudinal cross section. It is lined with endothelial cells where we make and store von Willebrand factor. And von Willebrand factor is released from these endothelial cells, not as single monomers, but as ultra large, ultra sticky multimers. These multimers are so sticky, in fact, that they need to be chopped into smaller, less sticky, more physiologically appropriately sized pieces. And the enzyme that chops these ultra large multimers into smaller pieces is Adam TS13. Then, if there is an injury, to the endothelium, von Willebrand factor binds to collagen in the subendothelial matrix. And when it does so, it gets exposed to shear forces along the edge of the vessel, which cause the von Willebrand factor to unravel, exposing its platelet binding receptors. And platelets can then bind to the site of injury and form a platelet plug, which seals up the hole. So what happens in TTP? Well, in TTP, just as in normal physiology, the endothelial cells secrete these ultra-large, ultra-sticky multimers, but there is a deficiency of Adam TS13. 
And so these multimers are not chopped up into smaller, more physiologically appropriately sized pieces. And instead, these ultra large, ultra sticky multimers are allowed to persist in circulation. And when they do, they are able to agglutinate platelets spontaneously, even in the absence of endothelial injury. And this can re, uh, result in the formation of platelet-rich microthrombi, which can cause uh, vessel blockage and downstream uh, ischemic organ injury. So I'd like to begin with a case. This is the case of a 17-year-old woman who is healthy except for obesity. She is not on any medications, and she presents to the emergency department with fatigue and easy bruising over the last week and abdominal pain over the last day. Her vital signs are normal. As the labs show, uh, she is anemic with a hemoglobin of 9.8 grams per deciliter. She is thrombocytopenic with a platelet count of 38,000 per microliter. Her kidney function is normal with a creatinine of one milligram per deciliter. She has an elevated reticulocyte count of 7%, an undetectable haptoglobin. Her INR and activated partial thromboplastin time are normal. So this is a question for you to ponder. I know we don't have an audience response system, but you can think about which answer you would choose. You review her peripheral blood smear which shows three to four schistocytes per high power field, as well as rare nucleated red cells. You order an Adam TS13 level, which will come back in three days. What is the probability that this patient has severe Adam TS13 deficiency, less than 10%? In other words, what is the probability that she has TTP? Low, intermediate, or high? And I will submit to you that the preferred answer to this question is intermediate. Why is that? Well, some of you may be familiar with a clinical tool for assessing the likelihood that a patient has ITP or TTP when they present with thrombotic microangiopathy. And this tool is called the plasmic score, where patients are evaluated across seven criteria that you can uh, obtain easily at the time of presentation. Platelet count, markers of hemolysis, presence of cancer or transplant history, mean corpuscular volu volume, INR, and creatinine. If the patient has a score of zero to four, that is said to correspond to a low likelihood of severe Adam TS13 deficiency, a score of five intermediate, and a score of six to seven, a high probability of severe Adam TS13 deficiency. So if we apply the score to our patient, she has a platelet count of 38, so she does not get a point in the platelet count category. She does have an elevated reticulocyte count and undetectable haptoglobin, so she gets a point for hemolysis. She has no history of cancer, no history of transplant, so she gets points for those criteria. She also has a point for an INR less than 1.5 and a creatinine less than two. And so if we total up her score, it is five, and that corresponds to an intermediate likelihood of severe Adam TS13 deficiency. But what do these terms low, intermediate, and high mean? These are very subjective or qualitative terms. Well, we tried to answer that question by conducting a systematic review and meta-analysis on the diagnostic accuracy of the plasmic score. We searched the literature for patients with suspected TTP, that is those who presented with thrombotic microangiopathy, who were evaluated by the plasmic score, as well as a reference standard, which included measurement of Adam CS13 activity, against which we could compare the performance of the plasmic score. We identified 13 eligible studies, which collectively enrolled 970 patients. And to cut right to the chase, this is what we found. A high probability plasmic score, a score of six or higher, had a sensitivity and specificity for severe Adam TS13 deficiency of 85% and 89% respectively. So there are two 
important interpretations of these results. First, the specificity of the plasmic score is not sufficient for it to be able to confirm the diagnosis of TTP. And so even patients with a high probability plasmic score require Adam TS13 testing to confirm the diagnosis. But more importantly, about 15% of patients with TTP will have a plasmic score less than six. And so a score of six or higher is not an acceptable screening tool for ruling out TTP. On the other hand, we found that an intermediate probability plasmic score, a score of five or higher, has a sensitivity of 99%. And so in other words, a score of less than five essentially rules out TTP. And so a plasmic score of five or higher is a reasonable screening test at the bedside when you are asked to see a patient with thrombotic microangiopathy. And these results build the backbone for this initial diagnosis and treatment algorithm that I use in my practice. If a patient presents with a thrombotic microangiopathy, the first question to ask is, does the patient have an obvious cause of thrombotic microangiopathy other than TTP? For example, DIC, preeclampsia, HELP syndrome, malignant hypertension, catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome. If the answer is yes, then you would manage those patients as appropriate for their diagnosis. But if there is not another obvious cause, a reasonable next step is to calculate the plasmic score and order an ADAM TS13 level. If the plasmic score is zero to four, low risk, as I've shown you, that basically rules out TTP. And so it's reasonable to consider alternative diagnoses and observe the patient closely without treating them empirically for TTP. On the other hand, if the patient has a plasmic score of five or higher, there is at least a fighting chance that that patient has TTP. And so it is appropriate to start empiric TTP therapy while awaiting the Adam TS13 level. And so our patient had a plasmic score of five. And so we decide to start empiric TTP treatment. And so that brings us to our next question. Based on a plasmic score of five, you decide to begin empiric treatment for TTP what should initial therapy consist of? And the choices are plasma infusion, plasma exchange, corticosteroids, immunoadsorption over an Adam TS13 column, or cyclosporin. And according to the recently published ISTH guidelines on TTP, the best answers to this question are plasma exchange and corticosteroids. So let's talk about the basis for these two treatments, which we now use in all patients with immune TTP. What is the basis for therapeutic plasma exchange? Well, the rationale, of course, is that by removing the patient's plasma, we are removing autoantibodies against Adam TS13 and perhaps also removing some of these ultra large, ultra sticky von Willebrand factor multimers. The rationale for giving normal donor plasma is that we are replenishing Adam TS13. And clinical support for using plasma exchange was proven based on this clinical classic trial uh, that was published many years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine by Gail Rock and colleagues, where patients presenting with acute immune TTP were randomized to receive either plasma exchange or plasma infusion. And the percentage of patients surviving is shown on the y-axis, and you can see that there is a clear survival advantage for those who were randomized to plasma exchange. In fact, many of the patients randomized to plasma infusion who weren't doing well crossed over to plasma exchange. And so this figure may actually underestimate the true survival difference between the two groups. So since this trial was published, plasma exchange has become, of course, standard of care for the treatment of patients with immune TTP. But the problem with plasma exchange is that it is just a Band-Aid. It is a life-saving therapy, but it does nothing to address the underlying problem, the production of autoantibodies against Adam TS13.
And so we need to add immunosuppression to address that problem. And the immunosuppressant that we have used now for many years for the treatment of TTP is corticosteroids. What is the basis for using corticosteroids? Well, we first learned that steroids might be useful for this disease in another very old study, again, published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1991 from Johns Hopkins. This was not a true randomized trial, but 108 patients presenting with acute TTP were segregated into two groups, those with CNS symptoms and those without CNS symptoms. Those who presented with CNS symptoms were all treated with plasma exchange and steroids. But those who were treated with, who presented without CNS symptoms, 54 of them were treated with steroids. And you can see here that 30 of these patients remained on steroids alone. Those who did not respond to steroids had the addition of plasma exchange, but 30 patients were treated with steroids alone. And 20 of eight of them got better with steroids alone without any relapse. And so this was an early hint that steroids may have a role in this disease. It wasn't until many years later that we understood why steroids help in immune TTP. And so this came in a study that was published in 2017. This was a pilot clinical trial where patients presenting with acute TTP all treated with plasma exchange and randomized to immunosuppression with either prednisone or cyclosporin. And the results are very interesting. And they are shown in this figure here, where you see Adam TS13 activity on the Y axis, and you see different time points on the study on the X axis. The blue curve represents patients who are randomized to prednisone, and the red curve represents patients randomized to cyclosporin. And what you can clearly see is that the patients who were given prednisone had recovery in their Adam TS13 activity, whereas those who were given cyclosporin had no recovery. And so steroids are an important part of initial treatment for TTP because they hasten Adam TS13 recovery by counteracting the production of anti Adam TS13 autoantibodies. So, you treat the patient with daily plasma exchange and prednisone, one milligram per kilogram per day. Her platelet count and lactate dehydrogenase improve with treatment. Her, her pre-plasma exchange Adam TS13 level comes back at less than 5%, and a strong inhibitor is detected, confirming the diagnosis of immune TTP. You consider adding rituximab at this point. Which of the following is an argument for adding rituximab to the initial therapy for this patient? A, rituximab reduces the number of plasma exchange sessions needed. B, rituximab reduces the rate of relapse. C, rituximab reduces the length of stay in the hospital. Or D, all of the above. And I will show you evidence that supports that the best answer to this question is D, all of the above. So first I'll show you tables from two historical observational studies. Um, these are both from the UK group. In the first study, they compared a cohort of patients with TTP who were treated with plasma exchange, steroids, and rituximab with a historical control group of patients who were treated with only plasma exchange and steroids, no rituximab. And what they found is that patients in the rituximab group had a shorter median length of stay, 16 versus 23 days, and a markedly reduced relapse rate, 10% versus 57%. In a separate study, the same investigators asked, is it beneficial to give rituximab early versus late? And so they compared patients who received their rituximab within three days of admission versus those who received rituximab beyond three days. And what they found is that early administration of rituximab was associated with a shorter median time to remission, 12 versus 20 days, fewer plasma exchange sections, 16 versus 24, and a shorter length of stay in the hospital, 16 
versus 23 days. Now, there have subsequently been more studies looking at whether initial treatment with rituximab for an acute episode reduces relapse rate. And I think that the evidence is quite clear on this. This is a forest plot from a recently published systematic review and meta-analysis that shows that initial treatment with rituximab was associated with a significantly reduced risk of relapse with an odds ratio of 0 0.40. So in other words, rituximab reduces the rate of relapse by something like 60%. So because of these advantages of rituximab, um, the patient's platelet count normalizes with treatment, plasma exchange is discontinued after 10 sessions, she completes a prednisone taper, and you decide to give her a course of rituximab, 375 milligrams per meter squared per week for four weeks. At her one month follow-up visit, she feels well, and her ADAMTS-13 level is now normal at 82%. You decide to follow her with periodic clinic visits and Adam TS-13 levels every three months. And so 18 months later, you see her in follow-up. She remains in clinical remission. She has no complaints and her CBC is normal, but her Adam TS-13 level has now fallen to less than 5%. So in other words, this is a woman who remains in clinical remission, but has had a recurrence of severe Adam TS-13 deficiency. What do you advise? Choice A, observation only since the patient is in clinical remission. Choice B, corticosteroids to reduce the risk of relapse. Choice C, rituximab to reduce the risk of relapse. Or choice B, D, splenectomy to reduce the risk of relapse. And according to the recently published ISTH guidelines, the preferred answer to this question is choice C, preemptive rituximab to reduce the risk of relapse. So the first point that you that to, to make is that the natural history of immune TTP is a very high relapse rate. We know this from many different studies. Here is uh, data from the French cohort that shows that in patients with a, an episode of immune TTP who recovered but did not receive rituximab, the relapse rate was 74% at seven years. So a very high relapse rate. If we give rituximab to patients who have developed recurrent severe Adam TS-13 deficiency but remained in clinical remission, it results in most patients in a rise in Adam TS-13 activity. That's what's shown here, where you see the median Adam TS-13 level at zero or at less than 5% in these patients who had had a recurrence of severe Adam TS-13 deficiency, and it rises into uh, uh, normal range after treatment with rituximab. There has also been a systematic review and meta-analysis to show, based on only two studies, that it appears that this preemptive use of rituximab in patients who have a clinical remission but a recurrence of severe Adam TS-13 deficiency is associated with a strong reduction in the risk of relapse with an odds ratio of 0 0.09 favoring rituximab. So this is the way I explain it to my patients who have had at least one prior episode of acute immune TTP and have now developed recurrent severe Adam TS-13 deficiency despite remaining in clinical remission. Would you rather that we be proactive, treat you with preemptive rituximab to hopefully bring the Adam TS-13 level back up and prevent relapse or would you rather we take a reactive approach where we simply observe you and wait to see if you have another acute episode, another relapse, and then we admit you to the hospital and put in an apheresis catheter and treat you the way that we did before? And I can tell you that when I explain the options to my patients, almost always they have been very traumatized by their initial episode of immune TTP, and they have a strong preference to take a proactive approach for preventing relapse.
There are many open questions that still remain to be answered about the use of preemptive rituximab, and I've listed some of them for you here. Some patients can live with severe ADMTS-13 deficiency for years without clinical relapse. How do I know my patient will relapse if I don't treat her or him? How often should ADMTS-13 be measured in clinical remission? What ADMTS-13 threshold should prompt consideration of preemptive rituximab? What is the optimal dosing of rituximab? Are four doses necessary? Are there safety concerns with repeated courses of preemptive rituximab? And what can be done for the 15% or so of patients who do not have an ADMTS-13 response to rituximab? When we treat them with rituximab, their ADMTS-13 level remains severely deficient. I won't answer these questions now, but I'm happy to discuss them during the Q&A if they're of interest. So you discuss the pros and cons of preemptive rituximab with the patient. She elects to proceed. She is treated with preemptive rituximab, 375 milligrams per meter squared times one dose, on Adam TS-13 level one month after initiation of rituximab is normal at 98%. So I now want to briefly move on to a second case. This case has similarities, but also important differences with the first case. This too is a 70-year-old female who is previously healthy except for obesity. She is not taking any medications, but she has a different clinical presentation. She presents with slurred speech and confusion for the last six hours. And her laboratory studies are different as well. She is anemic with a hemoglobin of 9.8 grams per deciliter. She is more severely thrombocytopenic with a platelet count of 18,000 per microliter. She has an elevated serum creatinine of 1.8 milligrams per deciliter. She has markers of hemolysis, including a reticulocyte count of 7%, undetectable haptoglobin, and a markedly elevated LDH. She also has an elevated troponin I of two micrograms per liter. Her coagulation tests are normal. So what is the probability of severe Adam TS-13 deficiency in this patient? Well, if we are to calculate a plasmic score, she gets points for all seven criteria. Her platelet count is less than 30. She has markers of hemolysis, no history of cancer or transplant. Her MCV is less than 90. Her INR is less than 1.5. Her creatinine is less than 2. So she has a high likelihood of TTP. But remember, the sensitivity of uh, an ad a plasmic score of 6 or higher is still only about 89%. So we still have to do Adam TS-13 testing to confirm the diagnosis. Meanwhile, we need to st start her on empiric treatment for TTP. But unlike our patient in the first presentation, this patient presents with several red flag symptoms. What do I mean by that? Well, these are data from uh, the French cohort where they compared characteristics among 100 survivors and 33 non-survivors of acute TTP. And what they noted is that non-survivors tended to be older, to have a higher frequency of neurologic involvement, to have a higher serum creatinine, and to have a higher troponin I. And our patient is young, but she has several red flags, including neurologic involvement, an elevated serum creatinine, and an elevated troponin I. And the concern here is that this could be one of the patients who is at risk for early death. And so based on that concern, I want you to ponder the following question. You begin plasma exchange, corticosteroids, and rituximab, but you are concerned about this patient's risk of early death because of those red flag features. Which of the following interventions given in conjunction with plasma exchange has shown potential to reduce ischemic complications and early death compared with plasma exchange alone? Corticosteroids caplicizumab, echolizumab, recombinant Adam TS-13? And the best answer to this question is caplicizumab. So caplicizumab is a nanobody uh, 
that binds to the A1 or platelet binding domain of von Willebrand factor. It was approved in the United States about a year ago. I'm not sure whether it's available in Saudi Arabia or not. Um, but this antibody, as you can see here, binds to the ultra-large von Willebrand factor multimer and prevents platelets from binding to these ultra-sticky multimers. So their patient cannot form these platelet-rich microthrombi that cause vessel occlusion and ischemic organ injury. Caplicizumab was approved based on the pivotal phase three Hercules trial. In this trial, 145 patients with acute TTP were randomized to plasma exchange plus or caplicizumab or placebo during plasma exchange and for 30 days afterward. And investigators were allowed to continue the study, study drug for up to 28 more days until Adam TS13 recovery. And so what are the key results? Well, there was a statistically significant, but I would argue clinically insignificant reduction in the median time to platelet normalization between the caplicizumab and placebo groups, 2.69 versus 2.88 days. Caplicizumab was also associated with a shorter median duration of plasma exchange and median length of stay. But what about clinical outcomes? Well, most notably, caplicizumab was associated with a substantial reduction in TTP recurrence in the 30 days after plasma exchange was stopped, 38% in the placebo group versus only 4% in the caplicizumab group. And although not statistically significant, there was a hint from this study that caplicizumab could potentially reduce early death. There were three patients or 4% in the placebo group who died versus none in the caplicizumab arm. Now, for a drug that uh, interferes with the interaction between von Willebrand factor and platelets, you might expect that bleeding is an important side effect, and indeed it is. Bleeding events were more common in the caplicizumab arm than in the placebo group, 65 versus 48%. But fortunately, most of these bleeding events were mild or moderate in severity and did not require discontinuation of the drug. But like plasma exchange, it's important to remember that caplicizumab is a Band-Aid. It, it could be potentially life-saving in the acute setting, but it does nothing to address the underlying formation of autoantibodies against ADAMTS13. And caplicizumab happens to be a very expensive Band-Aid. In the United States, a 30-day course costs $270,000. And so because caplicizumab is so expensive, we in the United States are grappling with how to use it. One possible strategy, and this is uh, a strategy that would be favored by uh, some clinicians, is that we should give caplicizumab to all individuals who present with acute TTP, along with plasma exchange, steroids, and rituximab. But strategy two, which is the strategy that may prove to be more cost effective, this requires formal testing, is to limit the use of this very expensive drug to two groups. Patients like the one that I presented to you with high risk features, such as neurologic symptoms or elevated troponin, who could be at risk for early death, as well as patients with refractory disease, that is those not responding to standard therapy. Another important question that still remains to be fully answered is how long should caplicizumab be continued? According to the United States Food and Drug Administration label, the recommendation is that the drug be continued once daily for 30 days beyond the last plasma exchange session. And then if severe ADAMTS13 deficiency persists, treatment may be extended for a maximum of 28 more days while immunosuppression is being optimized to try to achieve ADAMTS13 recovery. An alternate approach, and one that I have been using in my practice, is to monitor ADAMTS13 levels weekly in my patients with TTP 
who are on capilocizumab and continue the capilocizumab only until Adam TS13 recovery, and or at least until it is no longer severely deficient, which I define as a level of 20% or more for two consecutive weeks. At that point, I stop the capilocizumab, even if it is less than 30 days after the last plasma exchange. So a few take-home points from my presentation. The plasmic score can be used to decide who to treat and who not to treat while awaiting the Adam TS13 level among patients who present with a TMA. Initial therapy in those suspected to have TTP includes daily plasma exchange and corticosteroids. The addition of rituximab to initial therapy reduces the time to response, the number of plasma exchange sessions needed, the length of stay and relapse rate, Preemptive rituximab in patients in clinical remission but who have developed severe Adam TS13 deficiency recurrence reduces the risk of relapse. And finally, caplicizumab reduces the composite of major thromboembolic events, recurrent TTP within 30 days, and death, but questions remain regarding patient selection and duration of therapy. And so I want to thank you very much for your attention, and I uh, look forward to the Q&A. Thank you, Prof. Adam, for this excellent talk and uh, overview about this important topic, DTB. Uh, I think we'll move to the uh, question um, section. And I will start with this question, uh, Prof. Adam. Um, regarding the preemptive um, Immunosuppression like rituximab. How do how frequent do you measure the Adam TS13, and which level will trigger you to uh, start uh, the preemptive treatment? Yeah, thank you. Very important question. So um, once a patient has had Adam TS13 recovery um, after an acute episode, I typically follow the Adam TS13 level every three months for the first two years. Now, if during those first two years, the Adam TS13 level begins to decline, I will follow the level more frequently. Um, so if, if there's a big fall from one check to the next, then I may ask for another level a month later, for example. After two years, um, if the patient's Adam TS13 ha level has remained completely stable with no downward trend, um, I start to space out my testing to every six months. And I have some patients who have are um, more than five years out from their acute episode, have not required additional preemptive therapy. And in some of those patients, I only follow them once a year. Um, but I will admit this is just my practice no one knows the optimal approach for this. Um, the second question, also an important question, what is the Adam CS13 threshold I use for initiating preemptive rituximab? Um, my typical threshold is uh, less than 20% because that's the point where the patient appears to be inevitably approaching severe Adam TS13 deficiency. And I would like to bring the level up before they ever get to the point of severe Adam TS13 deficiency where the risk of uh, clinical relapse is substantial. Thank you, Prof. Adam. Another question uh, uh, is that, is there any ongoing studies um, using cablocizumab with different combinations like rituximab, et cetera, looking for uh, the long-term outcome, not only the short-term uh, outcome or is there any post hoc analysis for the Hercules uh, RCT? Because, you know, cablocizumab does not um, affect the pathophysiology or the um, uh, autoimmunity. Um, so is there any going studies or that looked for the, uh, or looking for the long-term outcome, like the relapse rate using cablocizumab? Um, so, um, yes, there are studies on this, um, and it's an important question as well. So. I showed you the results of the phase three Hercules study. Um, Caplicizumab was also studied in um, the phase two Titan trial. And in the phase two Titan trial, something very interesting happened. So just like the phase three Hercules study, um, patients 
were randomized to receive either placebo or caplicizumab in addition to plasma exchange. But the difference is that in the phase two Titan trial, um, there was no allowance for the caplicizumab to be continued until Adam TS13 recovery. The Adam uh, a caplicizumab was typically just stopped, I believe, 30 days after the last plasma exchange session. And it turns out that there was a very high rate of TTP relapse in the caplicizumab arm after it was stopped. Why is that? Well, it's because those patients, most of them had not received rituximab and they had severe Adam TS13 deficiency. And again, caplicizumab is just a Band-Aid. It was protecting them from developing uh, a clinical relapse as long as they were receiving the drug. But as soon as it was stopped, because they still had the autoantibodies and because they still had severe Adam TS13 deficiency, a substantial percentage of them relapsed. In the phase three Hercules trial, there was the important lesson from the phase two study was learned. And so investigators were encouraged to optimize immunosuppression and try not to stop the caplicizumab until Adam TS13 recovery had occurred. And it seemed to pay off because there was a much lower rate of relapse in the Hercules trial than there was in the phase two Triton trial. So I think the, the clear lesson from this is that caplicizumab is a very important tool for treating TTP, but it is not a replacement for immunosuppression. You still need to give immunosuppression. And the way I think of caplicizumab is a treatment that buys us time. You may even allow you to discharge the patient, um, get them more quickly off plasma exchange, discharge to the home where they can continue to receive caplicizumab, but the caplicizumab should not be stopped until the patient has been treated with immunosuppression uh, leading to Adam TS13 recovery. Um, and yes, there are um, studies, including post hoc analyses of, of Titan and Hercules, as well now as real world studies that are being published about um, longer term outcomes in, in, in patients who were treated with caplicizumab. And I think the message is clear. Caplicizumab alone does not protect from relapse once the drug is stopped. But if it is combined appropriately with immunosuppression, that is a really powerful way to treat patients with TTP to improve their chances of recovery from acute episode of survival, and then along with immunosuppression, reducing the risk relapse. Thank you, Professor. Uh, another question, what do you consider caplicizumab in patients with a mixed type TTBHUS? Uh, yes. A typical HUS? Um, so, um, no. So, uh, you know, I think we now know that TTP and, and let's say, a a atypical HUS are are different diseases and they require different treatments. Caplicizumab is really a specific treatment for TTP where the underlying problem is the formation of uh, platelet-rich microthrombi due to ultra-large, ultra-sticky von Willebrand factor multimers. I wouldn't expect caplicizumab to work in a patient with atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome where the underlying problem is overactivation of the alternate complement pathway. And in a disease like that, the, you know, a, a more appropriate treatment would be a complement inhibitor like echolizumab. Thank you, Prof. Adam. There is another question. Um, in patient responding to plasma exchange, how long do you continue steroids? Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting question, and I don't think that we we know the answer to that. What is the optimal approach for giving steroids in patients with TTP? Um, I can tell you what I do. Um, I will typically continue. I typically give um, prednisone one milligram per kilogram per day. I typically continue it at that dose until I have successfully gotten the patient off of therapeutic plasma exchange. And then I start tapering the prednisone. Um, and I try to taper it fairly quickly over um, typically sometime between two and four weeks. 
Thank you, Prof. Adam. Another question. Uh, how would you treat a patient with congenital cell deficiency of Adam T-sterine, the congenital yeah. TTP? Yeah, thank you for that question. So um, congenital TTP is, it is truly a different disease, and we've learned quite a bit about it in the last couple of years. Um, different clinical manifestations, and importantly, different treatment. Um, patients with congenital TTP uh, tend to respond very well to simple plasma infusion. And so um, some patients have a more severe course and require um, prophylaxis with plasma infusion every few weeks. Others may have a milder course and may not need treatment all of the time. Um, there is also some excitement in the um, development of a novel treatment for congenital TTP, and that is um, recombinant Adam TS13, um, which is being uh, studied now uh, in patients with congenital TTP. And I certainly expect that um, we, we know we know from an earlier phase trial that it appears to be quite promising in this disease. I will also add that there is um, a clinical trial studying recombinant Adam TS13 in immune TTP as well. Um, and it is conceivable that someday something like recombinant and Adam TS13 and caplicizumab could potentially replace the need for plasma exchange. But we, we have a long way to go before we can get there. Thank you, Prof. Adam. There is a question by Prof. Ahmed Al Askar. In the best we used to use the cryopur plasma, the plasma exchange, has this practice proven effective? Yes, um, thanks for the question. So the rationale for using cryopore plasma is, of course, that um, cryopore plasma um, it contains very little von Willebrand factor, since von Willebrand factor comes out in the um, cryoprecipitate. And so in, in a disease like immune TTP, where there is a problem of having ultra-large uh, von Willebrand factor multimers and deficiency of Adam TS13, it seems very logical to provide a product that um, is depleted of von Willebrand factor. Um, the clinical evidence that um, has been published, though, suggests that cryopore plasma and plain old fresh frozen plasma um, are equal in their effectiveness. And so it is not necessary to use cryopore plasma in this disease. Another question, Prof. Adam, with the plasmic score, what's the significance of chistocyte in another world, the peripheral blood will morpholate while incorporating the chistocyte and probably increase the sensitivity, specificity? Yeah, that's a very important question um, because the point is, is that the plasmic score is only intended to be applied to patients who present with thrombotic microangiopathy meaning that they have schistocytes in their blood smear. So if you are asked to see a patient with thrombocytopenia, and when you look at the blood smear, there are no schistocytes or only rare schistocytes, TTP is typically not something that should be on your differential, and the plasmic score is not intended to be applied to such patients. So you schistocyte, look at the smear first. Once you've determined that the patient has thrombotic microangiopathy, then the plasmic score. Thank you, Prof. Adam. Other question, the dose of rituximab, is it important to be for doses if the patient responds earlier? But those who do not respond to the rituximab, what would be the next? Yeah, this is, uh, to me, one of the hardest questions in TTP management right now. So as I we talked about, rituximab is a very helpful treatment as part of initial therapy, and it is also important for preemptive therapy to reduce the rate of relapse. And the way it does this, presumably, is by um, shutting down uh, the B cells that ultimately lead to formation of autoantibodies. And so patients, about 85% or so of patients, will have improvement in their Adam TS13 level after they are treated with rituximab. But about 15% of patients do not 
have an Atom TS13 response to rituximab. And my presumption is that that is because the autoantibodies are being made by um, CD20 negative plasma cells. And so um, there are some who have argued that it is appropriate to use anti-plasma cell therapy in such patients, um, drugs like um, bortezomib or even daratumumab. Um, but I have to tell you that the evidence for those drugs is, is not very strong. Um, other options I would include splenectomy, which has been shown to reduce the risk of relapse, and then other immunosuppressive drugs, uh, mycophenolate mofetil, uh, cyclosporin, cyclophosphamide. But we really um, need much better evidence to, to answer that important question for those, those unlucky patients who do not respond to rituximab. Thank you, Prof. Adam. Uh, a second, another question. Is there any role for gene therapy in congenital TTB? Is there any ongoing studies like hemophilia's patients? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, there ought to be. I'm not aware of any ongoing studies, but um, it seems like a logical target to me for, for gene therapy. Um, and, 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 and part of the reason I say that is because you may not need very high levels of Adam TS13 expression to ameliorate uh, the disease. So very similar to hemophilia, um, even if you bring a patient from less than 1% factor level to 10%, you can make a big difference in that patient's life. And I think um, the same could potentially be true for congenital TTP. And so I think this is a really appealing idea, but I personally am not aware of any trials that are going on right now. I, ho I hope that there will be in the future. Just a comment from uh, uh, Prof. Ahmed Al-Askar. To answer your question, Prof. Adam, Cablasizumab is available in Saudi Arabia and it's, uh, um, uh, it's registered already. Um, uh, another question, Prof. Adam, and probably this will be the last question. Any role for prophylactic plasma exchange in those who is in clinical remission? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, it is not something that we would typically do in patients with immune TTP. Um, because again, um, the goal is to try to give immunosuppression to get rid of the Adam TS13 autoantibody, bring the Adam TS13 level up so that you don't have to continue these temporizing or band aid therapies like plasma exchange. And of course, plasma exchange has lots of important toxicities um, infection, thrombosis, bleeding related to the catheter, um, the side effects of. Um, of the plasma itself. And so we would prefer not to do this if we didn't have to. But for patients with congenital TTP, um, it, there are patients where periodic prophylactic plasma infusion every few weeks uh, is appropriate. One more last question, Prof. Adam. Do you follow those patients with low plasma score? Yes, I do. Thank you for that question. The presumption is then that these patients have most likely some other cause of thrombotic microangiopathy, for, for example, atypical HUS or, or something else. And so we, um, the consulting hematologists, um, are, are often the ones that help the uh, clinical team to make the diagnosis and suggest appropriate therapy in these patients. And of course, we're also following these patients to make sure that their clinical course does not evolve in such a way as um, to um, make us think that maybe they do have TTP after all. So at the end of this webinar, um, I would like to thank Prof. Adam and thanks for all the attendees who joined us um, uh, tonight. Thanks again for the uh, Sanofi Genzyme for sponsoring this webinar. And just a reminder for the next uh, uh, webinar next week. Um, it will be next Saturday. And uh, 
and it will be um, about how I treat uh, PV, need to be and hydroxyurea and case presentation on uh, polycythemia vera by uh, Dr. Haifa Al-Ali and Dr. Amal Al-Ali. And uh, thank you all and have a good night. Thank you, Prof. Adam. And have a good night, Prof. Adam. Thank you. Well done, everybody. Thank you very much.